from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Library of Congress. It's good to see so many people here today. Our program today is a continuation of our Congressional Conversation Series in which the library invites current and former members of Congress to discuss their careers in public service. It's a real honor and privilege for me to welcome Representative Jackie Speer today and to welcome her to the library. Representative Speer has had a distinguished career in public service, from her time as a congressional staffer, as a state legislator, and her current role as member of Congress. She represents the 14th District of California in the House. Everyone knows where that is. San Francisco area, absolutely beautiful. She is the ranking member on the House Armed Services Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations and also serves on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Among the issues that she has focused on, ending sexual assault in the military, gender pay equity, consumer protection, cybersecurity, and student loan affordability. Representative Speer has a fascinating personal and professional story to, to share with us. She's overcome adversity numerous times in her life and channeled those experiences into an impressive and distinguished career in government service. Our conversation today will be led by Colleen Shogun, the Deputy Director of our National and International Outreach Service Unit here at the library. Colleen is a political scientist by training and a self-described lover of Congress. I also, I also want to commend to you this wonderful book, which um, Representative Spear co-authored. I think you'll all appreciate this title. This is not the life I ordered. <laughs> this is a great book to keep right at your desk when you're having those bad moments. Um, I've already consulted it several times. So it's my pleasure um, to welcome Representative Spear. Thank you. Guys. Terrific. Uh, good morning and welcome to the Library of Congress. I think we're going to have a great conversation here this morning. At the conclusion of our conversation back and forth, uh, Representative Speer is happy to take questions from the audience. But I'm going to kick us off. So you were interested in politics at a young age, but you didn't grow up in a particularly political family. Uh, for your confirmation, you chose the name Jacqueline uh, because of Jackie Kennedy. So can you tell us at a younger age, what got you interested in politics and public service? I came from a very blue collar family, um, first in my family to go to college, uh, not politically active, as you pointed out. I guess it was, you know, I was 10, 11, 12 years old during the uh, Camelot era of the Kennedy administration. And, and I think everyone in the country was uplifted by this young couple who had taken um, Washington by storm and the, the, the sense of hope and um, aspiration that was, I think, so, so vividly th there and palpable. And so I, I guess that's what first drew me in. And then uh, I did take the name of Jacqueline as a confirmation. I hated the name Karen. <laughs> because my mother would always yell, Karen, and it would just drive me nuts. <laughs> so uh, I took Jacqueline as the confirmation name, and then I went from a public uh, elementary school to a Catholic girls' high school by choice, which is another interesting point in my life. And so I, I was meeting a whole new group of, of students, and so I just decided that I was going to take my nickname at mm -hmm. that point and make it um, Jackie. So that's how, how that evolved. In terms of politics, I think I just remember reading the local newspapers and I was drawn to this local mayor who was young, mm -hmm. Leo Ryan, mayor of South San Francisco, who then ran for the state assembly and got elected. And 
you know, there, there's a plan for all of us, and we don't always know the plan, but I'm 16 years of age. Uh, my parents get a solicitation in the mail for Assemblyman Ryan's reelection. Mm -hmm. I take it, fill it out, say, I have no money, but I would volunteer. And then Saturday morning, my job was to vacuum the house. And so I'm vacuuming the house, and the phone rings. The vacuum cleaner's still going. I hear this voice on the other end saying, would you come to be interviewed? And it was Leo Ryan, and he was having a campaign meeting at his home in Millbrae. And I went up and was interviewed, and they were actually interviewing young women to be what they called that year Ryan girls. Mm -hmm. And there's a picture of me in my office as a Ryan girl. And it was at the height of the Beatles. So we all had um, boots, black tights, little mini skirts, a little um, kind of British hat on. And uh, we went around the communities just campaigning for then Assemblyman Leo Ryan. So that's how it all started. And you continued to work for Leo Ryan when you went to UC Davis and you went as you were going to law school as well in California. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Leo Ryan? He had a unique view of uh, his job as a representative. Uh, he became your political mentor. So can you talk to us a little bit about what Leo Ryan was like? So he was, I always said he ate bureaucrats for lunch. I mean, he, <laughs> he had this, this in, inquisitive sense of um, wanting to know more. And he was you know, a teacher by profession, so he taught history and government and English. And he you know, told me that I didn't know how to write when he read my paper in college. And it was actually a critical analysis of his operation. And I had gotten an A minus on it. He crossed the A minus on, uh, crossed the A minus out and put C minus and said oh. I didn't know how to write, oh. and he was going to teach me. Yeah. But uh, he also had this sense of being experiential um, because he had a, a healthy sense of skepticism. He wanted to do things himself. So after the riots in. Uh, Los Angeles. He went down there and taught school there for a week. Uh, he wanted to look at the criminal justice system in California, so he put himself in Folsom Prison for a week mm -hmm. um, to evaluate that and actually wrote a play based on his experience there um, that never got published. But So he had, by his very core, this sense of wanting to see firsthand. There was nothing like being there as opposed to listening to some advisor tell you about a particular issue. Mm -hmm. When you were working uh, for Congressman Ryan as a senior legal counsel after you had graduated, after you'd earned your law degree, uh, in 1978, uh, Congressman Ryan decided that he would lead a delegation to Guyana to uh, visit the People's Temple commune that Jim Jones uh, had assembled in Guyana. And you were a senior part of his congressional staff at that time. Can you tell us about the decision uh, that Congressman Ryan made to actually lead this delegation? Why did he decide to go to visit Jonestown um, and knowing that it was a dangerous, uh, could be a dangerous trip? Well, first of all, I don't think he thought it was dangerous. Mm -hmm. He presumed that he had a congressional shield that that would somehow protect him. Mind you, there were no military escorts that um, joined us on that trip. He had had a, a friend whose son had been involved in the People's Temple who was mysteriously killed at a railroad tracks. We had a number of constituents in the San Mateo part of the district whose young adult kids got involved in the People's Temple it was a huge church in San Francisco. Jim Jones was very politically active and connected and served both on the Human Rights Commission and then on the Housing Authority. So had it wired there. There was a, a group of family members that came about, concerned about loved ones in Jonestown. There was a couple who had been part of the People's Temple who had their son who was still in Jonestown that they wanted to get out. And so this all kind of came together. We had lots of meetings. There was a, a member of the People's Temple who had fled through the 
the embassy in Georgetown, Guyana, and come back to San Francisco that we interviewed, um, who talked about all of these horrendous activities going on, the sexual assault, the physical assault, the gun running, the uh, mind control. So it was on that basis, he was chairing a subcommittee on oversight of American citizens abroad that he decided that he was going to do like he had done before, and that was to go see firsthand. Mm -hmm. So you traveled uh, to Guyana and you did get to go to Jonestown to see the Pe People's Temple Commune. Uh, you were there for uh, a number of days and there was unrest uh, and there was even a, an assassination attempt on Congressman Ryan's life while you were there. And it was decided there was uh, some people that maybe wanted to leave uh, Jonestown, there was defectors, and it was decided that, that you would vacate, uh, that you would head to the airstrip. Uh, and there would be planes that would uh, be there to transport you. And when you were there, uh, there was an ambush from people from the People's Temple, actually, uh, and they shot and killed Congressman Ryan along with four other people and severely wounded you uh, in the process. Um, since it was such a remote airstrip, you actually s stayed there for 22 hours without medical attention or really any help. So can you take us back to that day and, and talk to us about what you were thinking uh, when that happened and how this affected your future career path and uh, your future career in public service? So uh, just to take you back a little bit, we were in the commune for about 20, 24 hours, maybe a little bit less than that. We got there, we had a tour, um, we started meeting with family members, there was really a, a, a script that they were basically all mm -hmm. reading um, in their minds. And it was you know, pretty obvious that there was mind control. One of the reporters who was on the trip, Don Harris from NBC, was walking around the perimeter of the pavilion smoking a cigarette, and two people slipped him notes. That's the first indication we had that people wanted to leave. So we were there overnight. The next morning, I retrieved them and their belongings, and then word spread, and more and more people wanted to leave. And then it became clear that we didn't have enough room in the plane, so that we were going to do the first airlift, and I was going to leave with them, and Congressman Ryan was going to stay behind with probably another 40 or 50 people that wanted to leave. Uh, there was then the knifing attempt on him. The truck was about to leave. We stopped. He got into the truck. We went to the airstrip. Unbeknownst to us, there is a tractor trailer following behind us with seven gunmen on it. I'm coaxing a little Guyanese child out of the airplane because he had scampered up into it and we didn't have enough seats as it was. So I was trying to coax him out so I could put people on the plane, uh, on the two planes. And all of a sudden this noise broke out. And at first I had no understanding of what it was. People ran into the bush. Congressman Ryan ran under the plane and so I followed suit and um, hid underneath a wheel. Uh, they came and they had ID'd who they wanted to kill and so they shot us at point blank range. Uh, Congressman Ryan was shot 45 times and you could be helpful to me because I always say I think he's the only congressman in the history of this country who's been assassinated in the line of duty, but I've never been able to absolutely confirm it. So that, That's, I think, true, actually, because I remember when I worked at CRS, this was an inquiry that we had that we worked on, so I actually remember that. Okay, all right. So, it's, <laughs> And uh, I was lying there playing dead and was shot five times, so the whole right side of my body was, uh, was blown up. And I looked down and... There was a bone shooting out of my arm and my leg was totally blown up. And so what happens in a moment like that is that you, um, you know, you're in shock, of course. But it was almost like my mind was telling me that half my body was good and half my body wasn't and I was just going to ignore the half of my body that, um, you know, wasn't relevant. Um, I was lying there and literally, what, what do you do when you think you're dying? I mean, I thought, my God, this is it. I'm 28 years old. Uh, this is it. I'm not going to live to be 85. I'm not going to have get married and have 2.5 kids and live happily ever after. This is it. So um, I was raised as a good Catholic girl, and the first thing I did was say the act of contrition and literally waited for the lights to go out. And when they didn't, uh, 
my grandmother, who was then in her mid-80s, kind of flashed in front of me, and she was this powerful matriarch in my family. And I said, I'm not going to have her live through my funeral if I can avoid it. So I kind of dragged my body to the cargo um, hold of the plane because the engines were still revving. And one of the reporters, actually from the Washington Post, came up behind me and says, hurry up, Jackie. And I said, well, I, I can't. I'm dragging my leg. So he shoves me into the cargo hold. And the plane wasn't going anywhere. There were bullet holes through the engine and one of the wheels. And eventually they took me out of the plane, put me on the side of the airstrip. Unfortunately, it was on an anthill. Um, but you don't sweat the small stuff when um, you're dying. So um, one of the reporters had a tape recorder nearby. And I asked him if I could um, leave a message for my parents. And so I. Um, tape recorded a message to my parents and kind of a last will. And then was on that airstrip for 22 hours without medical attention. There was a tent nearby, so they put me in the tent. And through the night, the producer for the NBC um, affiliate would come over to the tent, because they were now at a bar in Matthews Ridge. He would bring a, <clears throat> excuse me, he would bring a, a bottle of rum Guyanese rum for me to take swigs of, and it was very potent Guyanese rum. So that's how I got through the night. Um, but it was those moments that I decided that if I survived, I would never take another day for granted, and that I would live every day as fully as possible, and that I would commit my, my life to public service. And so that was kind of one of those defining moments. Um, and it really provided me an extraordinary gift. Mm -hmm. Because at a very young age, I learned that there were no tomorrows. No tomorrows are guaranteed. And how precious every moment was. And once you've almost died, you're not afraid nearly as much to do things that others might see as mm -hmm. a little risky. Mm -hmm. As you recovered, uh, you decided to run for Congressman Ryan's seat, and you uh, didn't win the primary, but you quickly pivoted after that and ran for a local supervisor's election, and you did win um, that seat. And you went on to have a very distinguished career in local and state politics, serving in the California legislature, both in the Assembly and also in the Senate. Uh, can you talk to us about your time in local and state politics? What lessons did you learn in state and local politics that prepared you to be a member of Congress? I think the, the lessons I learned really stemmed from Congressman Ryan. I mean, just not being afraid to go after something. And I remember one of the first issues I dealt with was a, a local utility had a transformer that spewed out PCBs in someone's backyard, and they said, oh, no, this is not a problem. Mm -hmm. And I took them on. It was Pacific Gas and Electric. It's no small utility, right? Ironically, I'd have another experience with them more recently. But, uh, and so you know, I, I learned early on that you can go up against very powerful interests mm -hmm. and succeed. So it was you know, a lesson that um, has held me in good stead. And, you know, I like slaying dragons, or at least trying to. In 2007, we are the Library of Congress, so we like to talk about books. Uh, so in 2007, you published this book, This Is Not the Life I Ordered, with three other women. Can you tell us the story of this book? Why did you write this book, and how did you come to write it with three of your friends? So this book um, was five years in the making. Um, a group of friends and I would get together once a month um, to help each other, to support each other. We'd all gone through uh, traumatic experiences. I had lost my husband in an automobile accident when I was pregnant with our second child 14 years after Guyana happened. And I had always thought everyone gets their fair share of grief, but then that happened and it was incredibly devastating. So we would get together and have um, lunch. And the rationale for getting together every month was that we were going to write a book. We never put pen to paper for the first four years. Um, and then eventually did and wrote the book. And it became a, um, and we told stories, not just our own, but those of other women who had gone through very difficult times. And, and it became kind of a how-to book of how do you get through it? Um, what are the tips? 
you know, creating a, a gratitude journal was one of the, the tips that we suggested, you know, and the first day it may be only that your dog didn't pee in the carpet, but, you know, the, the next day it may be something else. And we also suggested that what we had created was really key to our being able to survive, and that was what we called kitchen tables. So getting a group of people together as a, as a kitchen table that would support you, and that's it's the only reason it exists, is just to be together. And I've no, noticed in my life that I have a, a number of groups like that. Um, I have, um, we created a Merry Widows Club after uh, I lost my husband and then a friend lost her husband, and she's actually one of the co-authors of the book. And so over the years, there's been about 14 of us. No one wants to join this particular club, but um, mm -hmm. it has been a great source of support. And then I have my yoga girlfriends, and for the longest time we actually did yoga, and now we just kind of go on trips together. <laughs> <laughs> In 2008, you ran for Congress again. This time, uh, you won. You represent the home district where it all started from, and the same district that Congressman Ryan once uh, represented. You're a member of the minority party in the House of Representatives. You're a Democrat. Uh, tell us about what motivates your service to Congress. Uh, you're the member of a minority party in a majoritarian institution. The House runs by typically by majority rules. Uh, so what motivates your service uh, when serving in an institution that's not incredibly popular these days? But you love it. Yes, right, well, <laughs> I'm, part of, I'm part of the 10 or 11% that John McCain talks about. <laughs> so you know, the backdrop here is that I spent 18 years in the state legislature in California and had 300 bills signed into law by both, mostly Republican governors. So, I come here wide-eyed and bushy-tailed thinking I'm going to take all that I've learned uh, in the state legislature and apply it here, except there's a lot of differences, right? Um, you introduce a bill and you, know, you can dust it off every two or three years, but it's not necessarily ever going to be heard. That wasn't the case in California. Every bill got heard. Um, seniority here is as important as being in the majority, mm -hmm. um, that you really have to wait your turn. and. Um, it, it is a very um, hierarchical environment. And since I've been here, we have been in the minority most of the time. In the first two years I was in the majority and didn't know how lucky I had it. Um, so I would say that uh, I'm an optimist and I have the belief that we will be in the majority again and that we'll be able to do uh, good work and I think my job now being in the minority is to say the emperor has no clothes mm -hmm. when the emperor has no clothes, to, to be that voice that, that calls um, our colleagues out when they're, they're not speaking on behalf of the American people. And I, I mm -hmm. brought some slides to show you. Maybe right. this is a good time to do that. Right. Well, I'd like to talk about your approach to some of your House floor speeches, which is a bit unusual these days. A lot of times uh, members come to the House floor, they use talking points that are provided to them by your party. But you have a different approach when you talk on the House floor. You draw from personal experience. You're not afraid necessarily to call out perceived uh, uh, double standards practiced by some of your colleagues. So tell us a little bit about your style. Uh, is this uh, sort of spontaneous when you go on the floor? Do you decide to make these types of speeches? And how uh, has your frank rhetoric, has it had an impact? Have you seen an effect uh, by your approach? So I first realized the power of the floor um, one night when we were debating that Republicans had just taken over in the House, and the very first bill they introduced was H.R. 1, which was to defund Planned Parenthood to the tune of 400 or 500 million dollars. And we were sitting on the floor, it was late in the evening, and I was going to get up and speak on uh, the, the hypocrisy of somehow defunding Planned Parenthood because one clerk misspoke at a Planned Parenthood office, and somehow that was reason to defund it. Meanwhile, Halliburton had um, bribed foreign countries and was still getting billion dollar contracts from um, the US government. So that's what I was going to talk about. The member right before me on the Republican side started reading from a book about second term abortions. 
and he talked about the sawing off of legs, and I thought, oh my God, I, I mean, how can he be talking like this? So I kind of threw away my, my script, so to speak, and ended up talking about a second term abortion I had. And um, I remember finishing and, and trembling, and then John Lewis came up to me, and he had tears in his eyes. And he said, Jackie, that's the most powerful speech I've ever heard on the floor. Well, coming from John Lewis, you can imagine mm -hmm. how I felt. He said, it reminded me of when my aunt was living with us. And one day, she walked down the stairs in a blood-stained um, gown. My mother took her to the hospital, and she never came home again. And then, of course, it took off uh, virally, and I realized for the first time the power of the floor. Mm -hmm. And as I got into the issue of sexual assault in the military, I started telling stories of men and women who were sexually assaulted in the military whose lives had been totally destroyed. So that's mm -hmm. how it, mm -hmm. it first evolved, and then I recognized that you... Um, you, know, you can bore people to death with um, what you say on the House floor, or you can try and have an impact. So these are um, some of the, the slides we're going to show you now. Um, I, I do want to say at the outset, I can't begin to tell you how important your service is to all of us as members of Congress. I've had many of you come in over the years to um, brief me on issues, and um, what you do on our behalf is really priceless. So. I'm sure you um, are here because you believe in Congress and love Congress and um, are doing it for all the right reasons, and I just want to give you a shout out for, for being so very good at what you do. Okay, so let's start. This is, um, <laughs> is this a Chamber of Commerce, con is this a Chamber of Congress or is this a doctor's office? Uh, and I actually wore a white, uh, doctor's um, coat onto the House floor to make that particular speech. And these were props that you have when you're making the speech. Yes. These were next to you. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm big on, on doing posters. Mm -hmm. This was um, done, I, I was very outraged when Ray Rice and um, Ray McDonald, uh, both big football players, um, were not, uh, you know, taken out of uh, the games or once it was disclosed that they had committed domestic violence. Uh, and so this was an effort to try and get some public um, engagement on that issue. And the, the point was, you know, put them on the bench. Whenever someone is, um, is charged with sexual harassment or domestic violence, I mean, they, they basically are sidelined. You, you, you know, they're either fired typically or um, there, if you're a police officer and there's a, a due force used in a crime or potentially you're put on administrative leave and that, that's what I was just suggesting with that one. This one, this was, it was a, a floor speech because um, the Republicans had decided to sue President Obama um, because of the Affordable Care Act. So my point was there was no standing, it's a wait, it's a, um, taxpayer money being wasted, it was useless, it was a political stunt, it was inconsistent, it was a distraction, and it was also stupid. <laughs> this one I actually haven't done on the House floor yet, but I was pretty outraged when Burger King decided it was going to invert and um, join with Tim Horton in Canada. So I actually had an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act to require that any company that inverts could not continue to have a government contract. Uh, Burger King has 187 installations at military bases um, across um, not just the United States but all over the world. And you know they get free space, free electricity. I don't think they pay for the employees there. It's just you know a, a great boondoggle. And here they are. They're renouncing, for all intents and purposes, their U.S. Um, citizenship, so to speak, and inverting. So this is a, um, a whopper, <laughs> and it show, you probably can't see it there, but it shows the amount of money 
um, that the, I think it's something like um, $356 million uh, in subsidized services that taxpayers pay because they pay such low wages, um, their offshore profits, um, avoiding paying U.S. capital gains, $820 million, and avoiding paying foreign earnings tax, $275. So the total is $1.6 billion. Now that, ironically, that amendment was in the NDAA last year um, on bonk, so it wasn't going to be taken up until one of the members pulled it and said, well, wait a minute, this is legal. And so it, it got taken out and we ended up not um, putting it in. So they're continuing to um, run their Burger Kings on military installations. This was another one from last year. Um, they decided they were going after the sage grouse and the lesser prairie chicken and take them off the endangered species list. Um, and it has no, no basis in the National Defense Authorization Act. So we decided that we'd mock it a little bit on the House floor. And um, so there's a, an RPG um, on that Lester Prairie chicken, and we're commenting on the national security threat that it is. Um, <laughs> I've got very talented staff members. Here. <laughs> and this we've started doing. I, I was um, particularly incensed. I mean, I, I'm a victim of gun violence. I, I know what it's like to survive and um, you know, overcome the trauma associated with it. Um, that doesn't begin to deal with those who die and the, and the family members who are left uh, to somehow put their lives back together again. And so these moments of silence on the House floor had just gotten to the point where I couldn't take it anymore. And I actually walked out and the LA Times reporter happened to see me and I says, you know, this is hypocritical. You have a moment of silence, and then you're silent. And it's only these high celebrity, almost, shootings that we, we do a moment of silence. So I've started to go onto the House floor every month and uh, talk about each and every person who's been murdered in a mass shooting. Now, a mass shooting is four or more people that have been injured or killed. Mm -hmm. And these are the pictures of those who uh, were victims of mass shootings in April. And you can't necessarily tell it uh, because the, some of them are individual pictures. But the number of families that get gunned down is, is extraordinary. Uh, there was a great piece in the New York Times mm -hmm. um, on Monday that you probably saw that kind of talks about all of those who um, never get a moment of silence on the House floor. But, but what's the point? Mm -hmm. What is the point? And so that's um, what we've been doing. And we've now posted a wall outside my office. If you looked at the number of people who died since 1970 from gun violence and compared it to the Vietnam Memorial, it would be um, two and a half miles long. Mm -hmm. It would have 400,000 names on it. Um, and uh, there were, I think, 41 mass shootings in April, more than there are days of the month. Uh, this is, we had a lot of fun with this. We did a whole series on the Price is Wrong, and it was about um, spare parts in the military budget and how much money is wasted in uh, the spare parts budget. We have a DLA, it's a um, defense logistics agency, it's like the big, Home Depot um, that they're supposed to get their spare parts from, but then they end up uh, buying them from contractors. And so, you know, a, uh, an elbow, a plastic HVC uh, elbow that would cost a dollar at Home Depot, we paid $80 for. So this was one of those efforts where we did the prices wrong. How much does this really cost and how much did we pay for it? This one. You may wonder why I have a vodka bottle on the house floor. <laughs> I walked onto the, I was walking into the speaker's lobby with um, this bottle of vodka, a um, steak that had been cooked, and a phony jar of caviar on a silver plate. And the parliamentarian came up to me and said, uh, Ms. Spear, we can't have uh, demonstrations on the floor. 
I said, how is this a demonstration or an exhibition? He used some term of art. And he says, it's the silver tray. I said, OK. So uh, <laughs> I took the items on the house floor. And um, you're going to probably wonder what I was doing here. Well, I was offended because we were about to cut the food stamp budget by 50%. But just that um, month, a number of my colleagues had taken trips, Codell's, around the world and were dining in Russia on vodka and caviar and in Argentina on steaks. And I thought that, on the one hand, you know, it, it, it's OK for them to be, um, have their food stamp program but we're going to take food away from the poorest in our country. So this one, I don't know if it's going to be able to play, but this got to be kind of funny. And there was a, a piece that was um, a parody that was done on it. There we go. Good, thank you. You know, in the district, California 14, we have about 4,000 families who are on food stamps. But some of my colleagues have thousands and thousands more. Yet they somehow feel like crusaders, like heroes, when they vote to cut food stamps. Some of these same members travel to foreign countries under the guise of official business. They dine at lavish restaurants, eating steak, vodka, and even caviar. They receive money to do this. That's right, they don't pay out of pocket for these meals. Let me give you a few examples. One member was given $127.41 a day for food on his trip to Argentina. He probably had a fair amount of steak. Another member was given $3,588 for food and lodging during a six-day trip to Russia. He probably drank a fair amount of vodka and probably even had some caviar. That particular member has 21,000 food stamp recipients in his district. One of those people who is on food stamps could live a year on what this congressman spent on food and lodging for six days. Another 20 members made a trip to Dublin, Ireland. They got $166 a day for food. These members didn't pay a dime. They received 50, 100, almost $200 for a single meal, only for themselves. Yet, for them, the idea of helping fellow Americans spend less than $5 a day makes their skin crawl. The families of veterans, of farmers, of the disabled, of the working poor are not visible to them, not even when they are their own constituents. Last week, a man named Raman Sheikh wrote in an article on his LinkedIn page about food stamps. Ron is the founder, chairman, and CEO of Panera Bread. In this article, Ron admitted that despite wanting to fight poverty and hunger in America, he really didn't know what it was like to be truly hungry. And so this week, Ron is taking the SNAP challenge. The millionaire food mogul is living on $4.50 a day. I've taken the SNAP challenge in the past, and I can tell you it is a horrible experience. You think about food constantly. You are always hungry. But those on food stamps live on $4.50 every day, not for one week, for long into their future. That is soul crushing. Historically, food stamps have been part of the Farm Bill. It's that same bill that 26 corporate farmers who remain nameless get a million dollars each in subsidies meant for real farmers. The taxpayers are giving $7 billion per year to large agribusiness, yet Republicans feel SNAP programs cost us too much money. They want to cut it. Mr. Speaker, I can stand here and say that my point is about saving food stamps from cuts. That's true. But my larger point is about us as a country, as a society, as neighbors. 
I'm a member of the least productive Congress in the history of this country. I'm ashamed of that. To be honest, if the federal government shut down for a couple of weeks, as we keep hearing, would a even notice? When a government of the people or for the people becomes a government in spite of the people, then who are we really serving? If we refuse to take care of those who are the most vulnerable at a tiny fraction of the cost of, say, our defense budget, don't we cease to be true public servants? Ron Shake is putting himself in the worn out shoes of 48 million fellow Americans. I'm ready to do the same again. I wonder how many of my Republican colleagues would want to cut food stamps if they had taken the SNAP challenge. After all, that means no more steak, no more caviar or vodka. Based on these members' eating habits, I wonder if they could survive. I yield back. So um, there was just one last one I wanted to show you. Can I, there, th there it is. Um, so this is another way that you can make public policy. This is a bill I introduced, never had a hearing, never got voted on, but became law. And that's how sometimes we get things done, by introducing the bill, um, others recognize the importance of doing something about it. This was uh, a bill introduced to tell the Treasury Department to stop minting the dollar coins because no one was using them and we were spending $300 million a year to store them. So I introduced the bill, and three months later, the Treasury Department decided that they were going to stop minting them. <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Our last question today is just a general question. What's next for you, both personally or professionally? What's, what can we expect from you in the future? So my life has never been um, one that you could plan or predict. Uh, it was 29 years from the first time I ran for Congress to the second time I ran for Congress. That's a record in this, um, in this Congress. I never had any intentions of coming back to Congress. Once I left, I was done. So I don't know what's next. Um, we, we can't, I think, plan out our lives because there's always something that will intervene. So I'm going to just continue to make mischief. OK, terrific. <laughs> we can now take some questions from the audience. Uh, no, that's a very good question. Does it help me um, kind of respond to veterans? Absolutely it does. I mean, I was on an airstrip under fire for you know, a couple of minutes, and yet our men and women who serve are there day in, day, not, day out, um, you know, in, in enduring the most incredible um, atrocities. I spent the night in a, and you can see where uh, Congressman Ryan's has kind of filtered through my life. I spent the night at a homeless shelter in my district a couple years ago. And around 1 a.m., I'd been talking to lots of uh, people. And it was very um, edifying. Because I mean, the first people I met were two people who were working. One was working at Safeway in the bakery. The other was working in the warehouse um, at uh, Office Max. And working people living in a homeless shelter. But at about 1 a.m., this one gentleman comes up to me and um, tells me his story. He was a veteran. He got out. He had a six-figure job at Oracle. And then he hit a downward spiral, drugs and alcohol, and was last at the rehab program in Menlo Park. He looked me in the eye and he said, you have no idea what my country forced me to do in Iraq. And we don't. We have no idea. So post-traumatic stress is real. I, for that nanosecond that I was under fire, I had repercussions of it for a very long time. 21 gun salutes would send me uh, into orbit. Firecrackers going off would make me uh, twitch. So um, it, it is a very real result of war. And you know, we now know that what 30 or 40 percent.
percent of those returning from war are suffering from PTSD. Two questions, I think over here. Well, there's so many stories, I mean, and I, I experience them all the time. I, you know, I'll, I'll be in the grocery store and people will come up to me and thank me because we did job hunters boot camp after the Great Recession hit. I mean, what do you do when 10% of your population is out of a job? So we started hosting these job hunters boot camps that were not just job fairs with the opportunity to match with an employer, but also, how do you retrain yourself? I mean, if you're a middle-aged, you've lost your job, how, how do you get back in them? How do you avoid the discrimination that's so obvious? How do you use social media? So um, I've had lots of people that have come up to me and said, you know, I finally got a job. And you, know, and you could see that their lives had, had been, that they'd been reborn, or people whose mortgages were underwater I keep a helmet on a shelf in my office that was signed by a number of victims, survivors of sexual assault in the military. And that's just a constant reminder that uh, the work is really important that we do. And that sometimes it's a huge boulder that we're pushing up a hill and we never think we're going to get it up. But I mean, that's a great example with sexual assault in the military. I mean, yes, it should be taken out of the chain of command. That's what my legislation would do. Um, but we have gotten a number of significant improvements to the Uniform Code of Military Justice in the last five years by uh, some of the amendments that we have gotten in to the law that's improved the status of those who are sexually assaulted. I continue to be concerned about whistleblowers um, and the retaliation that they endure and we're dealing with that kind of an issue right now in the mm -hmm. intelligence committee. So those are all issues that um, I feel very strongly about and intend to be here to see them through. We have one question over here. Oh. Sorry. Okay. Oh. oh, no, no, no. You're over here and then over here. Mm -hmm. Hi, I wanted to thank you for your work on sexual assault in the military and I'm wondering if you've done any studies and this is on behalf of a cousin of mine on the link between sexual assault in the military and uh, our epidemic of military suicides? Mm. Uh, I have not done any studies, but I, I know that uh, there is some link to that because you can just see the downward spiral that takes place. What I was astonished by as I got to meet more and more of these survivors is uh, particularly the women were legacy I mean, their fathers and grandfathers and uncles had all been in the military, and this was a family commitment. And this was, you know, because it's an all-volunteer military now, these are people who join because they want to make a career of it. And because they're sexually assaulted and they report it, they, they basically lose their jobs. They're labeled with personality disorder. Now, imagine a DD... Um, is it DD 214? Um, that you then take to a future employer and it says you have a personality disorder. I mean, that's what they were doing. So you could see how their lives could easily unravel and that suicide um, would be uh, you know, their alternative to uh, continuing to live uh, in, a, in a state that was unacceptable. But I have not actually um, done any kind of study on that. It would be a word. <laughs> well, my schedule is not typical. I, I don't know what typical is. Um, <laughs> you know, the very first campaign I ran for uh, after 
I lost for Congress. I was running for the Board of Supervisors and I was told, now make this call, you're gonna get a $250 contribution. And I hemmed and hawed and then I made the call and I got a $100 contribution. So I've never been good at this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I'm not the type that will get on the phone and just raise money for the most part. Uh, I will do an event in my district and you know, people will come to the event. But I would say in terms of doing events back here, maybe four hours a month. Not, not what I would say is typical. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes, right here. Right, Lorraine. Mm -hmm. Last question. Last question, okay. It's a very good question. Mm -hmm. When we were about to make the trip, the State Department kept telling us, well, you know, we can't, you know, we can't force Jim Jones to meet with you. Um, you have to get an invitation on your own. We have visited the commune. They seem very happy. Everyone seems to um, be glad to be there. Meanwhile, you know, we've already had some defectors who come through the council office. Um, we had a, a briefing in the embassy in Georgetown a day or two before we actually went to Jonestown, and they provided us with a slideshow. Now, mind you, the slideshow had a picture of our two counselor officers with Jim Jones arm in arm. What kind of message was that sending? So I was pretty critical of state in terms of their... Um, lack of uh, recognition that they had a responsibility to follow up on so many of these inquiries that had been made about people being held there against their will, social security checks being improperly um, you know, handled. And I believe that the political trumped the counselor function in that regard. And bauxite was a very important component. We were in a lot of bauxite from Guyane at the time, and I think those interests trumped the interests of American citizens who were being held there against their will. Please join me in thanking Representative Spears. I have Spears. one more oh, comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I should have known, right? <laughs> yeah. I should have I learned. Just, I just want to leave you with, um, you know, my, my, you've got a sense of how um, the, the my life has, has um, meandered, and uh, I didn't touch on the loss of my husband when I was pregnant with our, um, our second child, but uh, it, it was another traumatic experience in my life. But I've learned something that's very important, and the quotation I want to share with you is one that I hope that um, you will uh, keep in mind. Life should not be a journey with the intention of arriving in a well-preserved body <laughs> at the end of your life, but rather you should be totally worn out, totally used up, martini in one hand, chocolate in the other, screaming, woohoo, what a ride. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.